today. It is the first week in December, so of course we're going to be doing some Christmas songs. If you are a first time visitor here, we're so glad that you're joining us. Horizon donates $25 to Compassion International in your honor. And you can find out more about them on their website at compassion.com. Our core values at Horizon, we are kingdom minded. We believe that the kingdom of violence, racism, and greed is crumbling. And the kingdom of Jesus is rushing in.
to be able to hear us as he preaches. And Holy Spirit, that you will speak to the Spirit within us. That you will empower us to live in our life. Anyone have a favorite Christmas song? Shout it out. Holy Night. Yeah. Any others? Oh, really? Yeah. God rest ye merry gentlemen. Yep. That's a good one. My favorite is um, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. It's so hauntingly beautiful. I feel like it could have come right out of one of the rings. You know, you could have some elves running across a snowy scene, and they could be singing O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, and be like, that fits. Today we're kicking off a new series called Christmas Songs, but we're not talking about those songs. We're not talking about Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, or even Noel. Um, instead, we're going to be exploring a number of songs that come up in the birth story of Jesus. Songs that usually go overlooked as we talk about wise men and shepherds. Um, and usually in December, I ask a bunch of guest speakers in to speak, because honestly, I'm like, Christmas has been done to death. Like... Christmas sermons have been done over and over again. You go up to someone who's even not religious, and they'll be like, baby Jesus, shepherds, why? They know the characters. They know the story. And a lot of times I'm like, there's nothing new to say. There's nothing interesting to say. I'm like, I'll let some guests come in. And because I'm just like, I, I don't know how to bring anything new. And if I'm bored with the message, guess what? You guys are probably going to be bored too, right? But this year, um, as I was reading through the Gospels, I came across Mary's song in Luke chapter 2, and I was like, oh, I forgot about this. Like, this isn't something that I feel like I've heard a lot about, I've heard a lot of sermons about, and uh, it's not something that really stuck with me or that I think about a lot. I forgot she said some of these things, and I began to read what she sang, and then I remembered, oh, wasn't, did somebody else sing a song? Zechariah sang a song uh, in the same chapter, and then we have the angel singing a song, and I realized that these songs in the birth story of Jesus actually convey themes of Advent. And each year at Christmas, we don't call our series during this season a Christmas series, we call it an Advent series. And you might be like, what's the difference? What's Advent? Advent comes from the Latin word Adventus, which means imminent arrival or something special or something important coming soon. Advent is the eager, anticipated arrival of someone special or important. And at Christmas, at Advent, we celebrate the arrival of Jesus by remembering how eagerly Israel was anticipating her Messiah. And we wait eagerly for Jesus' return, not as a baby, but as a king to usher in his kingdom and to set all wrongs right. That's what we mean when we say Advent. Advent is about hoping and waiting because we believe that when Jesus shows up, it's so good, it works backwards even to unravel the worst moments of our story. Advent is about yearning for the salvation of God in dark times, hoping because the arrival of a baby in a manger meant God had forever intertwined his eternal future with ours. And for some of us, Advent is very personal because we're waiting. We're expectantly hopeful about things. We're waiting for a spouse or we're waiting for a child. We're waiting to hear back from a publisher or from an employer. Or we're waiting to hear from a child that we haven't heard from for a long time. Some of us are patiently waiting to see our loved ones again who have passed away. Some of us are patiently waiting for test results or for a promotion. Life is filled with moments of eager anticipation. I know this is coming and I want it. I want it to happen. Life is also filled with moments of excruciating waiting. As we're like, I want this to happen, it hasn't happened yet. I want this to happen, it hasn't happened yet. That's the tension in Advent. One of the best modern examples, I think, of this uh, kind of waiting that we should be doing at Advent is a child waiting for Christmas. You know the anticipation in child has? I remember when I was a little, um, I really wanted a Nintendo 64. And I was like, I can't wait to I hope that I get a Nintendo 64. I hope that I get it because I am going to leave my family and run away forever. They know. I just get I was like, I need this Nintendo 64. I was so looking forward to it. Um, and you know, I'd go down and I'd like measure the boxes in the store, and then I'd go down and measure the presents. 
such a weird kid. I know, I know. That's how my parents knew I was a weird kid. And I'd be like, this fits the dimensions of a Nintendo 64 box. Could it be, my parents started keeping all the presents uh, in another locked room so that I could go in their bedroom. But anyway, I was eagerly anticipating Christmas. And kids are waiting for Christmas because they know their mom and dad are good. They're looking forward to the day gift arrived. They're counting down the days. And we look forward to the return of Jesus, or we should, with that same eager anticipation. Because his return will take, mean he takes his rightful place as king of the world. And he banishes sickness and racism and war and disease and death. Because he came as a baby, we're confident that he is coming again. Because Israel's eager anticipation for the Messiah was fulfilled, we hope and eagerly wait his return, knowing that we don't hope in vain. Because he came, we trust, we trust that he is coming. The Christmas story gives us hope to keep praying, keep dreaming, and keep working because we know that God shows up. We're not alone in the dark. So over the next four weeks, we're going to explore this theme of Advent and how four songs that characters in Luke and in the Gospel of John sing and how these songs incorporate into these themes of Advent. Today, we're exploring the first song, Mary song. It's in Luke chapter 1, verse 46 through 56. And Mary sang, My soul glorifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior. He has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him. From generation to generation, he has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. And Mary stayed with Elizabeth for about three months and then returned home. So a little backstory here. Mary had just had an angel come to her and say to her, you're going to be supernaturally pregnant. And the child you're going to have is going to be the long-awaited Messiah. And after hearing this news, the angel's like, and by the way, your relative Elizabeth is also having an unnatural birth. And so Mary's like, I'm going to go talk to Elizabeth. And so she leaves. And when she gets to where Elizabeth is, Elizabeth's baby, John the Baptist, we'll know later in the story, the baby kicks, and Elizabeth is like, the baby moved when you talked about what happened to you. And so Mary does what any of us would do. She bursts into song, right? Darby always says she wants her life to be more like a musical, where people are just like, the day is sad. And then they just like burst into song. And I always watch musicals, and I'm like, why are you doing this? There's people, right? There's traffic. You're gonna get hit. Get out of the street. You know. Or I'm like, the story was moving along, and I was getting invested. Then they start singing about what just happened. I'm like, we already saw that. You don't have to sing about it. Keep the story moving, right? Um, Darby wished her life was more like musical, and I always get annoyed. And I'm like, you know what? Real life isn't like a musical. But apparently, for Mary, it was. For Mary, she just burst out into song. Now. This song that Mary sings parallels the song that Hannah sung in 1 Samuel 2, verses 1 through 10. Hannah couldn't have children, and she begged, and she pleaded with God for a child, and eventually she had Samuel, whom she dedicated back to God. Now, in both cases, these are mothers who have been given supernatural pregnancies in order to change the direction of Israel forever. Hannah gives birth to Samuel, who anoints Israel's first father. King, that's right. Um, and Mary gives birth to Jesus, Israel's final king. Even more importantly, Samuel anoints David as king instead of the current wicked ruler Saul. And he creates the Davidic line from whom the Messiah would come. And like how David usurped the throne from an evil king, Jesus would wrestle control of this rebel world from the forces of darkness and roll as our rightful king. Hannah's song ends like this. Yahweh will give strength to his king, and he will exalt the horn of his anointed forever. Even though there was no king yet when Hannah sang her song, when God gave her a son, 
Hannah's song is prophetically looking forward to the mediator between heaven and earth, the one predicted in Genesis 3, who would crush the head of the chaos dragon, the Satan, the devil, and who would restore the world to the order of beauty under the rule and reign of God. Hannah sees her son as being an important part in that big story, and Mary sees herself in that same story, just at the culmination of it. This is like the crescendo. This is the most important part of this long story. The Son of Man has come to set things right. Now, this tells us something about Mary. She knows the scriptures. If you go back and you read Hannah's song, Mary's song is like a paraphrase of Hannah's song with her personal details put in. So Mary knows the scriptures, and she knows God's promises and is eagerly expecting them to be fulfilled. So I want to look at a couple key lines from Mary's song that I think can be encouraging to us as we live with eager anticipation in our modern world. There was 400 years without a prophetic word between the end of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New Testament. During that time, Rome conquered Israel and oppressed them, and they cried out, and God was silent. Now he hasn't just spoken, he has roared. He's not just like, I'm going to send a prophet, I'm going to send a servant, I'm going to raise up another Maccabean uh, revolt. No, he says, the long-awaited king himself is coming. Can you imagine how excited Mary was? Her people have been waiting 400 years to hear some continuation in this story that they have actually been tracking with for thousands of years. And they're like, hey, Mary, you're not just the next chapter in the story. You're the chapter. This is the, this is the critical moment. She would be so excited she'd probably sing about it. And that's exactly what she did. She doesn't just to get to be a part of the story. She's a critical part. Sometimes in life, we're in that space between the statement and the exclamation point. I hate that. Thing. Let's just get to the good part, right? Advent reminds us to wait with holy expectation. God doesn't give us space for pause without reason. Jesus is on the move. We're part of his story, just like Mary. We need to burst into spontaneous songs sometimes because we get to be about the same story that Mary has been a part of, Hannah has been a part of, and Adam and Eve were originally given the promise that a king is coming to set things right. So let's look at some of these lines in Mary's song. Verse 48, she says, God is mindful of the humble state of the servant. In fact, if you read through this, she mentions humility many times. Stay humble, stay hopeful. That's what Mary's song is about. Mary mentioned being humble over and over again in her song. She's from Nazareth, which is like, um, I grew up in Tennessee, not all of my life, but for a good portion of it, in a town called Saudi Daisy. That's a nothing town. It really is. For a long time, our big claim to fame was we had a McDonald's. You know, we were, we were a pretty cool town, you know? We had a gas station and a McDonald's. And then we had a Walmart, but it was not like Walmart. So if you think, it was like falling apart, like the ceiling was falling down, and like it was run down. Yeah, it was rough. Nobody was like, you know what? Expect great things from me. I'm from Saudi Daisy. Because nothing good came out of Saudi Daisy. That's kind of like how Nazareth was. It was a small mountain town that wasn't known for anything. Uh, she knew God hadn't picked the best connected or the most educated. Sometimes we can start to think we are... Um, that we deserve things from God. We think, God, why haven't you done this for me? Why haven't you done this? We think, I've been faithful. I've been obedient. I've suffered. We need to remember, everything is a gift. Every good thing you have in your life is a kindness and a gift. Now, I know what it is like to wonder if God is listening or even cares. Lots of people in Israel were wondering that for 400 years. But after 400 years of silence, notice what Mary says. God is mindful of us. He saw them. He thought about them. He cares about them. He sees us. He thinks about us. He cares about us. He's mindful of us. We should be humble by that. Because the God of the universe thinks about us. Instead of insisting that God acts and speaks in our timing and in the ways that we understand and approve of, Humbly rejoice that God sees you, he is with you in the waiting, and he is for you. 
In verses 51 through 52, notice what she says here. He has performed mighty deeds with his arms. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their throne, and he has lifted up the humble. There we have humility and pride again. It, Mary saw the announcement of Jesus' birth as the Messiah as proof that God was coming to shape the power structures of earth. God was coming to fight for the little guy. That's essentially what she's saying here. Thrones are going to be overturned. Those who have achieved power and influence through money and violence were about to have the tables overturned. Sometimes in life, we feel like we're nobodies. Like, man, I don't know any billionaire. I, you know, like, I'm not an influencer on social media with millions of Instagram followers. I don't build any kind of political power. Nobodies are God's favorite sometimes. Like, God always picks nobody. The Bible is filled with stories of God overlooking the influential, the powerful, and the rich to work through ordinary people, farmers, shepherds, fishermen. We could go on and on. He picks ordinary nobodies who, like Mary, are humble and recognize that everything they have is a gift. Now, verse 53. She says something here that I think is so controversial. She has just said, he has brought down rulers from their throne. And now she says, he will fill the hungry with good things and set the rich away empty. What a provocative statement. Now, I thought about this week. I chickened out. I was like, I didn't do it. But I thought about putting this up on social media, like um, saying, God is going to bring down, or uh, sorry, God is going to fill the hungry with good things and send the rich away empty. And I was like, you know what? I'm not going to do it. Because as soon as I say that, somebody's going to comment, you're a progressive political activist. You know, what are you trying to say here? Mary is talking about overthrowing the thrones. And sending the rich away hungry while the poor are fed. She's talking about Rome. This is a very provocative thing to say. Like if a Roman soldier heard her say this, she would be deemed a revolutionary. She could be killed for that. She's talking about the Israelite nobility who are in Rome's pocket. She's making an overtly political statement here. Mary sometimes like in pictures was like, she had clothes back her. And she stood in the background and she was like, go Jesus. I'm here for you, Joseph. You know, like, we just kind of have her in this side. Like, this song is like, she's a rebel. She's saying, I want Rome to be overthrown. I want the power structure that I've known my whole life to be dismantled. And I think this baby in me is going to do it. Like, that's pretty radical. She's like, the rich who have always had too much, we're going to take that from them and we're going to give it to the poor. That's like Robin Hood. You know, like, that's not how I usually think of Mary. Jesus came to topple the dark spiritual forces behind the world powers. That's true. But the words, ways, and works of Jesus demolished the immovable Roman Empire. Everybody who fought the Romans lost. They were a massive empire, a well-trained army. They had money and resources and education. Within 300 years, Rome would fall, not because people invaded it, but because the idea of Christianity, the words, ways, and uh, works of Jesus worked in people's lives and dismantled the Roman Empire from within. Within 300 years, Christianity was the dominant religion of the land. The Roman Empire himself submitted to the church. Her words here parallel Jesus' introduction to the Sermon on the Mount. You know how the Sermon on the Mount starts with the plus the pop the Beatitudes, that's what we call it. Um, it starts, what else do we call it? The blessed be section, right? It's like, blessed be this and this. Jesus explains when he introduces his kingdom in the Sermon on the Mount that his kingdom is not exclusive. He says, this isn't for the rich or the famous or the influential. Those were the kingdoms that people were used to in his day. Like, oh, you know the right people? You're in. You have enough money? You're in. You're born into the right family? You're in. And Jesus is like, that's not my kind of kingdom. My kingdom is for the outcast. My kingdom is for the unwelcome. My kingdom is for the alien and the pilgrim. He has come for the poor, the people who mourn, and the persecuted. And that parallels what his mother sang about when she came and visited her relative. She said, my son, this baby in me, the long-awaited Messiah, he's going to topple thrones. He's going to mess up power structures. 
The rich aren't going to like him because he's going to send them away empty. And the poor and the hungry are going to be fed. Verses 54 and 55. She says, He has helped his servant Israel. He remembers to be merciful. He has kept his promises to our end. This is how Mary ends her song. God never forgets a promise. He is faithful. He won't ever back out of a deal. And this is the tension that we feel in Advent. We celebrate because he came. Emmanuel, God with us. This morning, we're partaking of communion together. It's a moment when we take the bread and the juice and we remember that he came, that his body broke, that his blood was spilled for us, that we might be saved from sin and death. He is with us. We can enjoy communion, community with God because of Jesus. He came. We celebrate that. But we eagerly anticipate that he will come in Acts 1, 10 to 11, the disciples are standing around. Jesus has just uh, been resurrected and ascended. And they're looking intently up into the sky as he was going away. And suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking at the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go. That's the tension in Advent. We know he came. And it was a fulfillment of a promise. God was merciful. He kept his promises. And yet we hope to see him soon coming back because God is merciful and will keep his promises. Mary is like, listen, every one of you who reads these words long after I am gone, my people waited for generations for the Messiah to come. There were some dark, dark days when we were sure that God had forgotten us and that we were all alone in the universe. But he hadn't forgotten us. He doesn't forget. He is faithful. God remembers to be merciful and to remember to be merciful to you, too. Rich Belotus, the pastor and queen, says, Mary is the new Eve, and in her trust offers a new way of being. Eve said, let me have it. I want that fruit. And Mary says, let me, whatever God wants. Eve came from Adam, but the new Adam, Jesus, comes from the new Eve. So as we enter this Advent season, let our hearts join Mary's and cry out, not what I want, what you want. I'm going to be humble. I'm not going to assume that you need to give me what I want, when I want it. I'm going to trust that you have the right timing. I'm going to live in that tension of Advent that you've been faithful, you've kept your promises, and I'm going to believe that you're going to stay faithful and keep your promises in the future. When it is cold and dark and it seems like all light has gone out of light, let us hope because God is faithful. He does not forget. Let us eagerly anticipate the imminent return. The King is coming back. Lord Jesus, thank you for coming, for living a life and teaching us your way of life, and then taking our sins and going to the cross and dying in our place so that the relationship between mankind and and God, we live our lives to become your students, to live and love like you do, to become agents of love and people of peace. But God, we eagerly wait the day when you will come back and be king again. You will set up your eternal throne and you will right all wrongs. That your world will be so good and will unravel the worst moments of our story. And when we look back on our king now, we will only see your goodness. God, we ask that we will live with an eager anticipation about your coming at this, at this season when we remember that you came. Lord, help us to hold hope that you are faithful, that you keep your promises, and that you are coming. And I pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ.